This message was presented at the GYC 2015 conference called Chosen Faithful in Louisville, Kentucky. For other resources like this, visit us online at www.gycweb.org. Father in heaven, we come before you now just asking for your blessing and your presence upon this meeting. We, we ask that angels would be in our midst, that they would be encamped around about us, and that Satan's temptations and Satan's deceptions would not be welcome here. We just ask only for truth, the spirit of truth, that your Holy Spirit would govern and lead minds to Jesus today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with some hope. Tremendous, tremendous hope. Because I showed you some very scary brain scans the other day that are go- you're going, wow. Do you remember the one, for those who weren't here, you see it on the DVDs, but the, the brain scan of a pornography addicted brain looks actually worse than a cocaine-addicted brain in terms of the holes and areas of non-functionality in that brain. And then I showed you this scan right here. This is a normal human brain, and the pleasure centers are nice and bright and deep orange there with lots of activity. A normal person experiences lots of pleasure in life, but somebody who's addicted to drugs, and pornography functions exactly like a drug within the brain. We had numerous quotes from scientists on that. In fact, even more potent in many ways. This drug abuser's pleasure centers are kind of numbed, aren't they? Do you see how it's, they're they're just not enjoying life as much. The normal everyday pleasures to somebody who is addicted to hyperstimulation don't please. They don't stimulate. It's kind of like that statement from Spirit of Prophecy that says that those who have trained their tastes to love worldly things, if they were to go to heaven, they would find it uh, they would find it uninteresting. The word is the, the music of the harps of the angels and the voices of the angels would not satisfy them. So basically, there will be a lot of people who, if they were to go to heaven, would find it uninteresting and boring there, and God's not going to torture them with that. They're not going to be there if they wouldn't want to be there, right? And so this time, this probationary time, is a time period where we learn to develop our tastes and interests upon spiritual things and not worldly things so that we become the kind of people that would love it in heaven. Now, here's the hope, okay? Brain-damaged pleasure centers from hyper-stimulating addictions like drugs. After just one month of abstaining from drugs, look, it's starting to come back. You're starting to find pleasure in life again and not needing that drug to stimulate. Check this out. After 14 months of abstinence, there you have tremendous activity in the nucleus accumbens and the pleasure centers of the brain, just like a normal human brain. So if you're flat out addicted to pornography and engaging in self-abuse and these things we've been talking about, there is tremendous hope from science, not to mention from the Bible. What does it say in Romans 12, verse 2? It says you can be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. So God said it. All those holes and areas of damage and non-functioning in the brain that we saw, and you're just like, what have I done to my brain by engaging in these behaviors? God has promised that you can have a renewed mind. So there's the actual brain. I'm not going to even show you the one with the holes in it again because we don't even want to dwell on that. The old has gone. The new has come. And so here you are moving forward with that kind of mind, the mind of Christ. So I wanted to begin this session with hope because I know so many people are in the pit of despair and in the darkness of isolation and shame when it comes to this issue of pornography addiction. And this session is not just for the pornography addict. This is for anybody who wants greater victories in their lives because that's every single one of us, right? Yesterday we went into this issue. If the brain is powerful enough to get you addicted to a behavior, then here's the exciting news. It's powerful. It's just as powerful to get you addicted to a new behavior. And we went to the scriptures and saw that overcoming a habit is not the practice. It's not, it's not the exercise of letting something go and then just having a vacancy in the mind. No, Jesus said that if a demon is cast out and you just clean the house and put it in order, what's that demon going to go do? get seven more, more wicked than himself, and come in and occupy that house. So the process of overcoming is becoming, quote, addicted to a new behavior, a holy behavior. What it says in Isaiah, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I would do a what? A new thing. 
And so we talked yesterday about the process of rewriting and overwriting and rerouting the pathways in our brains that were so habitually, compulsively going down the path of lust, where even just taking a second look at that attractive image or woman is something that can be totally overcome in our lives. So what is our mental brain map filled with? We looked at this statement from Romans 6.16. 6, Do you not know that, who, to, that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Whether of sin, so you can be a slave of sin, leading to death, or of obedience. You can be a slave to obedience, leading to righteousness. And that's the kind of addiction we want. We want a compulsive obedience. We want to be addicted to purity in a pornographic world. Now, we talked a little bit about some practical aspects of that. And this was at the end of session four, after a long day, clumsily sort of walking through this, and we were all a little bit tired. So I want to reiterate this. Just a deep breath. When you're hit with a temptation, just a deep breath actually helps because there's a nerve in the back of the upper neck area that links into the limbic system where all the lust happens. And if you breathe a deep breath, it calms that nerve. So whatever the temptation, just a deep breath. How about this statement from Spirit of Prophecy? A good respiration soothes the nerves. Huh? It soothes that nerve, literally. Did she know in Ministry of Healing, page 272? Of course. And so you get more oxygen to the prefrontal cortex, which is where you have your executive centers of self-control. And so that's going to help you in this battle. Now, none of these individual things is the solution in itself. Just breathing properly is not going to be the solution. The New Agers will tell you that emptying your mind and just having meditation and breathing is going to solve all your problems. That's not the case. We're going to get into the ultimate solution. But we also talked about this concept of bouncing into holiness, where Satan throws you the temptation and you say, I'm I'm going to actually use this bad situation. God says, I work together for good for all those who love me. And we can draw ourselves into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ because of the temptations and challenges we face in our life, that God is using these to develop our character. And so that means that when that temptation comes, you remember, oh yes, God has created me with a sexual nature. And that means that that was intended to be used for my future spouse or my current spouse. And so you dwell upon the fact that marriage is a reflection of God's relationship with the church and the, the male-female relationship is an image-bearing relationship of God because God is relational, three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in a relationship, male-female in a relationship. And so all of a sudden you're thinking of high, holy, theological things instead of the debasing channels in the brain that we're used to going down. So it's sort of a judo move on Satan. You actually end up defeating him instead of just being neutral. So more electrical energy. This is new information today. More electrical energy is needed in the brain to reroute the circuit. The brain is created for habit because it just makes life easier. Can you imagine tying your shoes every day as if it was the first time you ever tied your shoes? Do you remember how torturous that was when you were a small child, like figuring out how to hold the bow there? And you're just like, ah, imagine if you had to tie your shoes like that every day. God made it so that we have habits and the brain remembers things that it has done. But the flip side of that is, if you have a bad habit, it takes a lot of energy to end that bad habit and go down a new neural pathway, a new circuit in the brain to, to forge a new path. It's kind of like taking a machete and going into the jungle, and you've got to be like working really hard to get through and create a path. If it's a well-worn path that people have walked for years and years, you go down without any effort whatsoever, right? So what do we do to get more energy in the brain? Yes, I do need to talk about health because this is not just some optional thing that's like, eh, more or less, it doesn't really matter. I come from churches where health didn't matter at all and I'd never considered it a moral issue and maybe you've never really considered your health and your diet to be a moral issue, but I'll tell you something. The more you are eating of unhealthy foods and you name it, go down the whole list, the more that's going to cause your brain to be foggy to be not able to have as much power and energy in this battle, okay? And so the more you're eating up healthy, whole foods, your fruits, grains, vegetables, nuts, uh, legumes, all of these plant-based foods, these are super good for brain energy. They release slowly over time. High fiber foods release slowly over time the energy that your body needs instead of like a, you know, drinking a Red Bull. I used to be addicted to Mountain Dew. And, you know, you got energy right away or a donut or whatever, you know, refined foods. After, there's a crash after that and you're much more likely to have 
brain fatigue, have situations where your brain just can't think and operate right and make good choices effectively. I find personally, I did this once actually, that when I was just becoming, quote, healthy, <laughs> um, I had given up meat, okay? But I was still eating any and everything. I mean, you can have like a super unhealthy vegan diet, right? You can subsist on French fries and Mountain Dew. That's a vegan diet. So <laughs> anyway, I... Um, I, I, I got uh, up in the morning, skipped breakfast, because I was like, work, focus on work, focus on work. And then it was about noon, and I was kind of hungry. And I went to, I do not do this, okay? This was, I, I've learned a lot since this time, early in my experience. I went to Little Caesars, and I picked up uh, just crazy bread, because, you know, cheese is wholly unfit for food, and I didn't want to eat the cheese. I still don't eat cheese. But uh, the, the crazy bread, that's okay, right? Yeah, that's a really healthy option, crazy bread. Just totally, completely refined white flour, just like bathed in all this. I don't even know what's on there, but, you know. I it gobbled all that down and got back to work, okay? My wife got back home a little while later, and I remember just being totally, like, irritable. Everything she said was just like, you know, I'm trying to focus on my work, you know, or just whatever. I'm like, I was being rude. I'm like, what's up with that? Well, I ate no nutrients all morning. And then just hit myself, hit myself with this just intense dose of highly refined white flour, which is, you know, nutrientless. It's everything's been stripped of it. And so just a, just a little anecdote from my experience. That's what woke me up to the fact that diet really does matter when it comes to the brain. So how about this? Are you getting enough vitamin D in the winter where you live? Okay, if you live in the northern latitudes especially, or if you're indoors a lot. I mean, you have to live in the, in the deep south, be outdoors all the time in the winter in order to be getting enough vitamin D. So I put an image of a little deep vitamin D3, vegan vitamin D3 uh, supplement on because I think there are times where it's appropriate to supplement. We shouldn't use that as an excuse to never go outside and things like that. But, you know, make sure D3 is important for brain health. There, it's linked with, you know, higher levels of depression, lower immunity, and all of these things if you're D3 deficient. I would also mention vitamin B12. This is something if you're not working in the soil, you know, the old ways of, of living, we, we, we got enough of these, these uh, microbes in our body. Uh, but, you know, most people get that these days from eating meat, and that's not a good way to do it. So, you know, consider supplementing with that. And how about this one? This is a very powerful brain nutrient that your body is getting good uh, what they're called essential fatty acids when you eat walnuts, when you eat um, uh, flax seeds. And there are different types of essential fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids being the, the key one that many people are deficient on. And if you're eating those, those um, walnuts, flax seeds, etc., you're doing a good job of filling your body with the ALA type of essential fatty acids under the omega-3 heading. But there are other fatty acids called the DHA and the EPA, and you need to be eating like sea vegetables for that, and a lot of us don't eat a lot of sea vegetables. So anyway, this is just my personal experience. These are my only three like go-to things that I supplement with consistently just to make sure I'm going above and beyond. I, we shouldn't lean on supplements. I'm not a big supplement guy, but anyway, the main thing is the diet. The main thing is removing the refined foods, the fatty foods, the dairy, the meat, getting focusing on the fruits and vegetables, and then just go over the top with these items as well. So the health is key. You know, speaking of health, it's not just food and diet and nutrition. There's more to health than that to keep our brains functioning in peak performance so that we can make decisions for Jesus Christ in those moments of temptation. Here you have a issue of sleep. Now notice this. So the effects of sleep deprivation include irritability, cognitive impairment. Do you want that when you're trying to fight this brain battle to gain victory? memory lapses or loss, or impaired, this is a secular site, okay, impaired moral judgment. That would not be something we want. So we've got to be sleeping sufficiently. And a lot of young people in here, if you're in the upper teens age group, 18, 19, I remember seeing a study, a research report that upper teens, 18, 19, actually need over nine hours of sleep. Nine and a quarter, okay? So, Probably didn't happen last night if you were bringing in the new year with prayer and then up for the breakfast at 6.30. But get back on this because we absolutely need to be getting enough sleep. It is crucial. It is essential. We should not have screens. They, they produce, they, they, uh, they, they, they lower melatonin, suppress melatonin production in the brain. Melatonin is that sleep hormone. If you're watching screens, viewing screens, you got your phone on so right before you go to bed, working on your computer or whatever, you need at least an hour before you go to bed of screen-free time, and that could be, you know, in the Word, that could be, you know, not, don't have it be heavy intellectual lifting, you know, just, just be just soothing into bed in that last hour, and that's going to help you have better melatonin, better quality sleep. Also, you get better quality sleep if you go to bed early. 
If you go to bed at midnight and sleep till 9, versus if you go to bed at 9 and sleep till 6, those two nine-hour periods are not created equal. The earlier sleep is higher quality sleep because melatonin is being produced in the brain after the sun goes down early in the night and then it starts to fall off as you enter to the morning hours. So be sure, if you're, if you're trying to study and cram for an exam, you shouldn't cram, but if you're studying for an exam or whatever, be sure to be getting up early. You know, go to bed really or get, get up really early and study instead of staying up till two or three in the morning studying because you're going to get better sleep. And this will help you in this victory over every temptation and just helping you be a better person, having a, a closer walk with Jesus Christ and hearing the voices from heaven, from the Holy Spirit and from the Lord's angels as he seeks to lead us in his path. Now, speaking of path, you ever get outside on a path and go for a walk? I'm not talking about necessarily vigorous exercise and having to have a you know, program of I'm, I'm jogging every day. Literally just walking, walking has a huge positive effect on the health. And yeah, more vigorous things are great, but what they found is they don't even add, actually add that much more value if you're doing like a you know, heavy workout program. Walking takes you like 90% of the way to health in terms of exercise. Very important for the brain health. And by the way, the 90%, that's not, not a technical scientific, I just like approximately, I'm just throwing that out there. From what I've read, what they're saying is the walking is by far the vast majority of the battle in terms of trying to get exercise. Not sitting for long periods of time, day after day after day. <clears throat> Do you remember this Twinkie analogy from the other day? Where it goes beyond just physical health. The Twinkie is an analogy for emotional health, for emotional healing. Because what they found is people are much more prone to lust addictions, to these habits of self-abuse, etc. If they came from homes that were emotionally disengaged, if they're intimacy starved in their lives, meaning they haven't had close connections, particularly with their father, then they, they have this, this, this hole, this, this wound, this deep uh, you know, pain that, that you may not even recognize, an insecurity, a chronic feeling of stress or depression. And even if just, just in, a, in a small way, God wants to heal us completely of all of our mental and emotional brokenness, which every single one of us has to a certain extent. He wants to fill us up with his love. And he wants also to have, to have us have connection with human beings. If we have close friendships, if we have close relationships with our family, it's kind of like you've just eaten a really good big salad. And then you go into that gas station and see the Twinkie, right? And let's say a big salad and a good nutritious meal of your favorite whole food, plant-based foods, okay? So you're full. Is the Twinkie as tempting when you're full? No, it's not, is it? So when you're full with the love of Jesus Christ, you have a great relationship with him, you have deep intimacy with your Father in heaven and with your best friends and with your family, then there's not as much of a draw to the counterfeit intimacy of the alluring woman who advertises herself to the brain as the brain sees that as potential intimacy, potential partner in, in, in marriage, spouse in marriage. And of course, it's so twisted and degraded. It's nothing like that. It's just a picture. And so it's reaching the low centers of the brain only. No, we can say no to that much more effectively if we are living health, healthy and if we have that emotional and spiritual health and relational health in our lives. Now, these things are only a small, very small piece of, what's, of what I'm about to get into. The much bigger aspect of this is the spiritual battle, okay? I want to give you some quotes, and then we're going to talk about Enoch because he truly walked with God. We're going to look at some verses and some quotes from Spirit of Prophecy. Here's a statement from mind, character, and personality. If Satan seeks to turn the brain, the mind, to low and sensual things, here's the, here's the, the command, here's the admonition. What do we do? Bring it back, okay? So we don't walk around passively. We actually take action in this, exercising the will. Everything depends upon the right exercise of the will. When corrupt imaginings seek to gain possession of your mind, flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. Heaven, there's your marching orders. When corrupt imaginings are seeking to take control of the mind, pray, immediately put your thoughts on Christ. By the grace of Christ, it is possible for us to reject impure thoughts. Jesus will attract the mind, purify the thoughts, and cleanse the heart from every, and there's the euphemism, secret sin. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting down imaginings, imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, bringing into captivity every thought 
to the obedience of Christ. Can we do that by God's strength? Absolutely. Because the converting power of God changes the heart, refining and purifying the thoughts. By the way, this is not a passive act on our part. The Bible says to take every thought captive. So this converting power of God is something that our will has invited and asked for and permitted and sought. And unless a determined effort is made to keep the thoughts centered on Christ, grace cannot reveal itself in the life. The mind must be engaged in the spiritual warfare. Every thought must be brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All habits must be brought under God's control. A couple more. The only security for any soul is right thinking. We are to use every means that God has placed within our reach for the government and cultivation of our thoughts. We are to bring our minds into harmony with his mind. His truth will sanctify us, body and soul and spirit, and we shall be enabled to rise above temptations. So when our mind is linked with God's, then we will be rising above all of these temptations. You know, if you think about the thoughts of Christ in the sanctuary, blotting out our sins, you, when, you, when you put your mind in that place and ask the Lord to be blotting out these sins from your heart, from your life, because we are the sanctuary, right? The sanctuary in heaven, the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven is, 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 a, is, a, is a symbolic act even of a greater cleansing where he is preparing and fitting us for heaven. The mind must be kept meditating upon pure and holy subjects. Remember yesterday when I said to everybody in the room, don't think about a pink elephant right now. And then everybody thought about a pink elephant, right? Because if the mind is not upon Christ, if we don't behold the new, then the old will slip back. The mind must be kept meditating upon pure and holy subjects. An impure suggest, suggestion, because Satan will suggest, and that's not, temp, that's not sin when that temptation comes in. Jesus was tempted in all points just as we are. What did he do when Satan suggested an impure suggestion to Christ? He dismissed it at once. And we must do the same. And we must instead, listen to this, a pure, pure elevating thoughts, holy contemplations must be entertained. Thus obtaining more and more knowledge of God by training the mind in the contemplation of heavenly things. This doesn't happen overnight, does it? This is the training of the mind over time to contemplate heavenly things. And that may be different for different people. What spiritual truths empower you, excite you? What, what aspects of the character of Christ really be, you know, captivate you? What scripture verses really have spoken to you? These are the high and elevated things that need to be filling your brain map. God has, simply, God has simple means open to every individual case, every individual, as I was saying sufficient to secure the great end, the salvation of the soul. Now, I mentioned scripture memory. This is absolutely essential. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 refers to those who have ex escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Lust. So he's specifically talking about the lustful passions, the appetites, whether sexual, food, or whatever, where he says your God is your stomach. For so many people, they're driven by the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. But there are some who can escape the corruption. Everybody can, but these are, he's describing having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How do we do it? Do you know the first part of the verse? I only gave you the last part. The first part, I kind of have it hidden there. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given us by which have been given us to us exceedingly great and precious what promises bible promises have been given to us inspired promises have been given to us so that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature the mind of Christ having his character and his nature reproduced in us. And that's how we escape the corruptions of the world through lust. So how do we escape lust? We have the promises of God in our hearts and we claim those promises at every needed moment. And there are a lot of those in the day. And then we can partake of the divine nature. So how do we have the mind of Christ? We claim Bible promises. You want, to, you want to memorize those? You want to have those at your disposal right away? Absolutely. This is crucial and essential. Let me plug my friend Chad's website, by the way. BibleMemorization.com Chad and Fadia Cruiser with Anchor Point Films have a wonderful whole series called The Overcoming Seminar. And so you want more and more on this, even beyond what's in 
a greater lust, specifically speaking about the lust issues, Chad and Fadia get into just overcoming in general as, as this does, but much, much greater. And a whole other series called uh, Transformed Brain, Transformed Life. They have a booth down in the exhibit hall as well. So I would suggest those as going deeper in the overcoming the victory. But, but, the, but the website that they put out called BibleMemorization.com really is based upon this scripture right here, that if you have the truths of God, how about what does the Bible say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against thee. So we have to hide the words of God in our heart. And that means this isn't somebody else doing it for us. No, 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 no. We have to be searching the scriptures, my friends. We have to be in the word ourselves, finding God's specific promises to us in that quiet hour that we have with Christ. Each morning, contemplating his life, dwelling upon his character, searching his scriptures as for a hidden treasure, because as if our life depends upon it, because our lives do depend upon it, our spiritual, eternal lives depend upon us governing ourselves in these things by the power of God. And so are you in the word daily for significant, substantial periods of time? It may take an hour before that scripture just pops right off the page at you and you're like, wow, that scripture, I got to memorize that. That's what I'm going to use consistently in my battle against, against addiction. Because the word addiction here And it may not be, again, a straight-up pornography addiction, but a habit of thought, a habit of the eyes that you want to have annihilated from your life. Do you know what this word addiction means? The the Latin root of the word addiction means devoted or being devoted to. So let's replace our addiction with devotions. Let's be devoted to our time with the Lord and never let that slip. And that, that is primary number one. That is absolutely essential, at least a short period. Don't do like all or nothing thinking where you go, well, it's supposed to be a thoughtful hour dwelling on the life of Christ, and I only have 20 minutes, so I might as well not do it because then I'm not following that admonition. How foolish would that be, right? I mean, just buckle down and get to it. God would rather have that 20 minutes with you than nothing, right? So that's what addiction means. It means devotion. Let's be, have our own devotions to replace that. But also, having Bible promises and being armed with spiritual and mental health and all of this is not going to work if we are inviting temptation into our lives. Okay, we can't be making provision for the flesh, as the Bible says. So if we're going places and watching things that are putting our in front of our eyes intentionally, deliberately, knowingly, things that are going to be drawing us from our Savior and tempting us deeply, you know, Christ has said that he will never let us be tempted. Here's a good one, by the way, to memorize. First Corinthians 10, 13. He will never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he will always provide a way out that you may stand up under it. But does that mean if I walk into temptation that I can presume upon him to save me from that? No, that's absolute, that's, 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 that's not, not right. I mean, he's given you a promise, but you can't presume upon that. You can have trust and faith, but not presumption regarding that battle. So it says in the Old Testament, it says, Set yourselves, stand ye still, see the salvation of the Lord with you. Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. You know what it says? You shall not need to fight in this battle. So who's doing the fighting really through us? It's Christ. So I just, I just gird up the loins of my mind and get ready and put on that armor of God because it's the sword of the Spirit. It's the breastplate of righteousness. It's the belt of truth. It's the helmet of salvation. It's all of these things that God has provided, and then he's doing the fighting as Israel did. But be careful, by the way. <clears throat> this is a quick disclaimer, important disclaimer. A lot of people are going, okay, I'm going to overcome my, uh, my habit, and I'm going to... I'm going to think about how to overcome my habit and I'm going to talk about how to overcome my addiction and I'm going to study and discuss and read about how to overcome my addiction. You know what? There's kind of a problem in this, isn't there? You keep talking about your addiction, don't you? My habit, my addiction, my habit, my addiction. Be careful that your battle against temptation doesn't cause you to become preoccupied with the temptation. The best way to overcome it is to have a new obsession. Okay, so don't say I'm going to have the, 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 the battle of overcoming it. No, don't think about the it. Replace that pathway with something new. So we want to be focusing on, as Isaiah said, behold, I will do a new thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. That could be something as simple as a new hobby, a new missionary outreach, just anything that will get you fired up, get your brain activated and on fire for something better, something that puts your thoughts on other things than the addiction, addictive behaviors. So... Here's some scriptures that are helpful in terms of not just having the scripture memory ready to go in the memory bank, and then I kind of, you know, I have my morning devotions, and then I kind of just move on with life. And, you know, if a temptation comes, then I'll grab a memory, scripture, scripture memory. No, we want to be walking with God continually. Listen to this. 
My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So how are our feet taken out of the snare? Only if our eyes are ever toward the Lord. So if you've gone a few minutes with no thoughts of God, if you've gone an hour with no thoughts of Jesus Christ and your best friend who's walking beside you, remember scriptures like this. No, my eyes must be ever toward the Lord. Because I said yesterday, imagine if every time Satan threw you a temptation, you were just thinking about Christ the moment before that. I mean, that, that is truly being armed for the battle, isn't it? How about this one? I have set the Lord, what's the next word? Always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. How do we not be moved? By setting the Lord always before us. Jesus says, remain in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. That means remain continually. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. Isn't that our culture today? Wow, my iniquities have overtaken me. Even your own sin, your own habits. In fact, for the addicted brain, you could completely remove Satan from the equation. He doesn't even need to tempt directly because the brain is already in that habit and temptation. So it's the evils around you. Yes, the devil and his demons doing the temptation, but also your, your own iniquities have overtaken you in the past. So what do we need to do? Have his loving kindness and his truth continually preserving us. But then he even says this, I am not even able to look up. Isn't that an interesting verse? Sometimes do you feel so discouraged by your sin that you can't even look to Christ? Just in wallowing and in pity and self-deprecation and, and shame. God does not want that. He's leaning over his purchased possession as the man at the pool of Bethesda. You remember the paralytic? And Jesus looked over at him and said, do you want to be made well? With that kind and forgiving face. That's so important. So when he says, I am not able to look up, maybe you need to ask Christ for strength to ask him for forgiveness. Ask Christ for strength to even pray to him. Just go and start talking to him. I don't even feel like I can talk to you right now. And just as you start that way, he's going to embrace you like the father who embraced the prodigal son. So how about this one? Here's the good news. When we do remain in him, you know this scripture, I can do how many things through Christ who strengthens me? All things, all things. Here's the desire of ages. We may leave off many bad habits, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to him, moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Isn't that a strong statement right there? That just said, if you don't have a moment by moment connection with Jesus Christ, you're going to be overcome. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. Basically just said the same thing, right? If we don't have a continual connection with Jesus Christ, we're going to end up sinning and following Satan's path in some way. You may not see clearly how you will obtain deliverance from sin, the sins which, ha which have been cherished. This is common for those in cycles of habits, habits and addictions. You, you're going, how in the world am I going to do this? I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried again, and I failed, and I failed, and I failed again. Well, it says you may not see clearly how you will obtain deliverance from the sins which have been cherished and strengthened with repetition. Your deliverance is to be found in Christ and Him alone. Now is your time. Now is the golden opportunity. You're at GYC. This is an opportunity where you're focused for a whole weekend. It's a new year today. Now is the time. Now is the golden opportunity. You can walk in purity only by what? Looking and beholding. Praying and believing in Jesus moment by moment. This is truly what it means to live the Enoch life that we're going to talk about in a moment. A couple more quotes. Satan leads man to break the bands which connect him in holy, happy union with his maker. Then, when he is disconnected because we got busy or we got distracted or we got frustrated about something, as soon as we're disconnected from God, passion obtains control over reason, impulse over principle, and he becomes sinful in thought and action. His judge, judgment is perverted. His reason seems to be enfeebled. If you will only watch, continually watch unto prayer, if you will do everything as if you were in the immediate presence of God, you will be saved from yielding to temptation and may hope to be kept pure, spotless, and undefiled unto the end. You know, I, I remember hearing a conversation between a, a counselor and a friend, and the, the, the counselor asked the friend who was struggling with self-abuse and pornography use, he said, um, do you believe in the omnipresence of God? And omnipresence means God is everywhere. And the young man said, well, yeah, of course, you know, God is, God is all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's all-present, everywhere present. And the, the counselor said, well, no, you don't. You don't believe God is all-present. Because when you're engaging in that, you're denying that, and you're believing the lie that he's not there. 
I never really thought about it that way. Like, yeah, wow, I guess I, I was believing a lie, not consciously, but I was totally neglecting the presence of God and pretending as if it didn't exist. And it was, it, he was non-existent to me at that point. So pretty interesting insight. If we truly believed and knew and experienced the presence of God with us at every moment, wouldn't that help us govern ourselves by his power and his strength? Now, once you've surrendered your life to God, once, you, once you've made a decision to say, I'm all in, I'll do whatever it takes, yes, uh, blocking software, reporting software, covenant eyes type of stuff, if that's uh, something that will help, uh, finding accountability, throwing away things that need to be thrown away, not going places that need to be not gone to, <laughs> not watching things that I shouldn't be watching. I'm willing to go all out. I'm willing to start new hobbies, to, to just totally create a new brain map with a lot of new things in my life. I'm going all out. I'm radical. I'm ready to do this. God, help me. You know what you're going to find? You're going to wake up the next morning, and a lot of the still of the same, the same brain is still there because this is a moment by moment, day by day experience of totally re- rewriting the brain. You have righteousness in Jesus Christ the moment you repent. Amen. He's forgiven you completely. But then there's a process of having your mind, practically speaking, renewed in a way that you no longer love those temptations and you love the things of God and you hate the temptations. That takes some time. Do you remember the 14 months? scan of that brain, okay? And I've heard other counselors say that in their experience watching relapses of sexual addictions and sexual behaviors, that a two to five year period of time is a window of time that you see much fewer relapses of people going back. So we're literally looking at many months of battling this with the armor of God and the strength of Jesus Jesus Christ in our lives, whether it's 14 months or two years, there's no magic number. But those are just some some wet finger in the air figures. Remember this, though. If you do have a moment of weakness and failure, don't go, oh, man, but this was the one where I was really committing, and now I'm an even bigger failure, and now I should be even more in despair. No, no, no. Listen to Jesus' voice at the woman caught in the act of what again? Adultery. And he said to her, where are your accusers? Who's the accuser? Satan. He says, I'm not here to condemn, but to save. I'm the loving physician. I've come to heal. He says, go and sin no more, but I'm not here to condemn. And yes, he'll give you that initial guilt impulse. That's important because that reminds us, oh yeah, that was wrong, but don't hang out there. Don't let that simmer. Don't let that ruminate because then you're just passing the brain over the very same pathways of the sin and widening those pathways and increasing the likelihood of sinning again. God wants to forgive you. His grace is abundant. It's totally prodigal. It's totally huge. It's bigger and deeper and wider than anything we could ever imagine. Don't doubt him on that. When he says, my grace is sufficient for you, it's true. Okay, so go right back and just claim that promise. A righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets back up, right? A righteous man. And this is not permission to sin. This is not cheap grace. This is not presuming upon God's kindness and I'm not going to truly seek him and I'm just going to live how I want. No, 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 no. This is God making provision for the needs of fallen, weak mortals, which is every single one of us. We need that grace and patience that he so abundantly offers. And he's never going to get tired of that, by the way. If you're going, okay, it said, it said a righteous man falls seven times, but I've done eight, nine, 10, 11, 15, 20 now. <laughs> what did Jesus say about forgiving? Seven times, 70 times? So we don't need a number on this. That's his way of saying, I will never, ever fail. I will never, ever get tired of telling you I love you because that's my character. He can't deny his own character. I will never forget, I will never, never get tired of, of, of forgiving. Okay, and again, don't use that as the evangelicals do and as I did in my growing up. I thought the Christian life was just you'll sin and you'll continue to sin and it's permission to sin and we're all sinners and that's just the way we are and God will forgive us and then we go to heaven. No, 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 no. We're going to get into that in a moment. But just to, just to dwell again on the character of God's patience, his forgiving love, he is infinitely forgiving and patient. And he will continue to do that until he finishes the work in you, just like he did in Enoch. Other than Christ himself, I would say Enoch has to be my favorite of all of the Bible, Bible men because he lived such a peculiar life, a peculiar life that it brought him to the point where he literally just walked with God so closely that he ended up walking into heaven. He had such a relationship with Jesus Christ, such a holiness in his life, such a love for souls that being in heaven was a more natural place for him to be. And God just invited him right there. 
And he, his Bible says that he was, he, was not, he was not, for God took him. And people were going, where did he not go? Well, they, they, they didn't understand this peculiar man. But he, being a peculiar man, what are we called in Peter's epistle where he says, you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and a what? Peculiar, peculiar people. And I want to I dwell upon Enoch for a moment. I have this wonderful book in my hands. It's called Living the Life of Enoch. It's a compilation of all the spirit of prophecy statements on the, the, the man Enoch's life. Having read through this, it's one of my favorite journeys through any book that I've read with Spirit of Prophecy in it. And you know, by the way, that Enoch is, it says here on page one, that Enoch is a pattern man. A pattern man, that's page two, rather. He's a pattern man, a representative man, meaning his life is a pattern or a type, a representation of what the lives of God's last day's people will be. It says on the very first sentence, the experience of Enoch represents what our experience should be. Far more than we do, we need to study the lives of these men. So should we do that right now? It just told us to study the lives of these men. I want to do that. If you study in the Bible, it's, it mentions Enoch a number of times, but very small references. You've got Genesis 5, you've got Hebrews 11, the book of Jude. It says a number of things. I'm just going to bullet point them for the sake of time, how Enoch is symbolic of us. Number one, he lived in an exceedingly wicked time. He lived right before the what? The flood. And is that what we live in, uh, an exceedingly wicked time? Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two, he preached during a time right before the world was destroyed. Isn't that what we're doing? Same thing. He was translated to heaven without seeing death. Isn't that what those of us who are alive and remain will see, will experience when Jesus comes, yes? He proclaimed the judgment. Did you know he proclaimed the judgment? He, in, in, in the book of Jude, it says, uh, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints uh, with judgment. He also rebuked the prevailing sins. This is in here, page, page 7. It, it talks about how he was rebuking the popular sins of the day, which we are also called to do, which John the Baptist did too as well. He's another type, uh, just like Enoch. Uh, he, you know, he had, he proclaimed the coming of Christ. I kind of just mentioned that in that scripture. He also had the spirit of prophecy. As, as a prophet, he had the spirit of prophecy, uh, as did Noah as well, as he was a preacher of righteousness and proclaiming the coming of the flood. So at this time, the spirit of prophecy existed, as it has throughout the totality of the scriptures, except during that period in, uh, in between the, t the Testaments where there, there was a silence for, for a period of time. But spirit of prophecy, of course, today, we have that as well as did Enoch. A, he also had a, 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 an experience where he was there to show that Satan's argument was false. Satan's argument about you can't actually keep God's law. You can't actually live a holy life. You can't actually obey the Lord. He, God is a tyrant. He has un, un, impossible commands and expectations that nobody could follow. That was a lie of Satan. Enoch disproved it because he lived a holy life. Uh, he also, of course, walked with God, which we are called to do. And I want to get into that. That's what we're going to spend the rest of the time on because this is the ultimate solution to the sin problem. It's a, the ultimate solution to all of, our, all of our struggles, all of our depression, all of our anxiousness, all of our fear, all of our uh, broken relationships. Walking with Jesus Christ is the ultimate solution to every single problem on the face of the earth. So let's get into this. Enoch's character, page three on, in Living the Life of Enoch, tells us that not a thread of coarseness or selfishness was woven into the web that this servant of God was weaving in his daily life. How much selfishness did he have? Not a thread. So when I said that he lived a holy life, this is literally true. He wouldn't have been up in heaven had he not, had he had selfishness and sin in his life. So God had completely annihilated in his, in his heart, in his mind, all love of this world, love of self. We also read here that holy men stood untainted. Perfect. Enoch and Elijah were holy men who stood untainted, perfecting righteous characters and were accounted worthy for translation to heaven. Did they have a completely matured righteous character? Yes, yes. And that's what entitled them to have this unique experience. Now you might say, Scott, how is that possible? I mean, really? The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that, you know, we're, we're all conceived in sin and born in sin and iniquity. Isn't that just a permanent condition? No, Christ is the healer of our sin. He will heal our backsliding. He says, I've come to, I'm as the physician to heal, and it's not the righteous, but sinners that, have, that need to come to repentance and that I've come to heal. So he's come to heal our sin completely, to have a renewed mind, to have the mind of Christ, to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ in our daily experience. Is it possible? 
Is it possible? In my strength, definitely. I, I think when you have the impulse of, that's impossible, that's kind of a good impulse at first because you're thinking about, that's impossible for me to do. But, you know, do you think I, we should take that privilege away from God to do that complete work in us? To completely give us matured characters ready and fit for heaven? Oh, that's, that, would be, that would be blasphemous to say that the Lord could not or ought not do that. Is he willing? Amen. Is he able? Amen. Then he will do it if we permit. Amen. So let me read to you about this. It says, if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Did you hear that? When we're obeying him, we're just doing what we impulsively love to do. Sin will become hateful to us, it says. I'd love to get there. That would be awesome, where every thought that is anything with even a thread of selfishness would be hateful. That's what it says God will do in us. He will cause us to be impulsively obedient, as I've said. How about this one? This is a little bit longer of a quote. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I, may not, that I have not run in, in vain, neither labored in vain. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Walk before me, and be thou perfect. Enoch walked with God three hundred years. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all his wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus, Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So enough said there. A bunch of scriptures rattling off the absolutely liberating doctrine that I don't have to live in sin right up until the coming of Christ, but that God is going to finish the work that he began in me and carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. By the way, a quick disclaimer on this, because many people take this one and become fanatical and, and just off the mark on it. So on page 59 of the book, it points out in, that, that when we are growing more and more to be like Jesus, it is imperceptibly to ourselves that we are changed. We are unconsciously reflecting his image. So even the people in the time of trouble are grieving over their sins. And so you're, not, you're never going to come to the point where you're like, I have a re a reached perfection. I have attained a perfect character. Everybody look at me. I mean, obviously, anybody that says that is not Christ-like in their lives. That was like the Pharisee that says, I am not like other men. I tie the, you know, all of, he goes. And then the other man is just beating his breast and saying, I am a sinner. And that's the attitude for the Christian. So moving on, how did he do this? How did he pull this off? Was it through his theological, theoretical, intellectual knowledge of Bible truth? It says in the book, we may have a knowledge of the truth, but this is not enough. We must bring its living principles into our lives, and it must sanctify our characters and flow out to others. So knowledge of the Bible in an intellectual sense is not sufficient knowledge in a relational sense to know God and know his truth and know the spirit of truth and know his word, that knowledge is a relational knowledge. That's going to be something that works out and flows into our lives where the principles of truth are, 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 are like we've, we've partaken of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, right? And then with symbolically with the bread and wine, Jesus says, eat this. And, 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 and the idea is that I am the bread that has come down from heaven. This is what nourishes us. This is what fills us. And it's assimilated into our very being, the character of Christ. Of course, not literally the body and body, blood of Christ. But, you know, another way that Enoch pulled this off is, is as I mentioned earlier, he was be willing to be peculiar. And I know that in our age, we live in a very conformist age where the media sets the tone and they set a cultural expectation and they say, this is the way you talk, this is the way you dress, this is the way you act, and you get with your friends and you, you just kind of live life in a way where you're going with the stream. I love the name of the youth, My Bible First um, uh, Sabbath School Quarterly. It's called Upstream. Are we swimming upstream? Are we going against the grain? That's what Enoch did. Enoch and Elijah became very different from the world in their plans and their objectives in life were also very different. Let me ask you this also. Do you think maybe they were also different, uh, particularly Elijah? Was he different than the religious people, than, than, than the people in the church in many ways? Yes. And in fact, I would suggest that if we're not even swimming upstream and against the grain from the many 
the, the, from the many tendencies and trends within the church, then we are in a problematic situation because the church is prophesied to be in a what kind of condition in Revelation 3? Laodicean condition. So we've got to be different and peculiar from the world and even setting, standing out, and not in a selfish way, but because Christ is changing us and he's going to change us to be different than the Laodiceans around us. Page 55 says that Enoch did not ask himself, what will my friends and relatives say if I take this course? He never consulted the opinions of man. He consulted what the Lord had to say. Now, how did Enoch's day begin? He did not mark out his own course or set up his own will as if he thought himself fully qualified to manage matters. Did you catch that? We wake up in the morning, we're like, what am I going to do today? We think about our day-to-day experience and we go for it, right? We're not qualified to manage our own lives. We're dust and ashes, right? And God has a will for us. We shouldn't even say, I'm going to go and carry on business and go to this place or that and do this tomorrow. The Apostle James says we should say, if God wills, right? So we've always got to be consulting the Lord like Enoch did. It also says basically that we get filled with busyness. We get filled with activity. And we live selfishly with reference to our own thoughts. Those are my terms. We live, we live in reference to our own thoughts and ways. Enoch did not do that. He always consulted the Lord and asked himself. This is the phrase in the book. He continued, at every point, at every turn, he asked himself, is this the way of the Lord? And that's something I want to be asking. Every thought, every conversation, every literary place I go, is this the way of the Lord? So what did he do? He spent much of his time in solitude, which he devoted to reflection and prayer. How much of his time? It says much. I don't know exactly what that is. I know he wasn't a monk. We're going to get into that. But he spent much of his time in solitude, which he devoted to reflection and prayer. It says God's messengers must tarry long with him, with Jesus, if they would have success in their work. By the way, if you're a Christian, you are a messenger and you have a work. So this applies to everybody. God's messengers must tarry how much? Long with Jesus if we want to have success in our work. There's a lovely description of this on page 17 that I want to read to you. It says the eloquence, this, this, this experience of being alone with Christ, tarrying long with him, being in solitude, in prayer, having that quiet hour. It says the eloquence of silence before God is often essential. If the mind is kept in continual excitement, the ear is prevented from hearing the truth that the Lord would communicate to his believing ones. Christ takes his children from that which holds their attention that they may behold his glory. His glory meaning his character. So, The eloquence of silence before God is necessary, and we actually need to turn our own thoughts off and let God give us thoughts in his word. I'm not talking about emptying your mind and entering into Eastern meditation, of course, because then we're not filling ourselves and hiding his word in our heart. That stuff is not going to be helpful. But nonetheless, we want that silence with God. Page 43 even says that we need to closely examine ourselves. You know, that's where personal devotions are really important because they're personal, because God's going to get personal with you. He's going to cut you to the heart, right, where you need to hear it. And I know that many of us like to hear what our itching ears want to hear. We want to hear an interesting sermon that kind of keeps our attention, and it's interesting, we learn some things, but then we go on with our merry lives, and we have a a, a segment of religion in our lives. We don't dip the the canvas in the in the die completely. We have a compartmentalized aspect of our daily experience that has a religious flavor to it, and we have a form of religion and deny the power thereof. This is not what this is about. This is about having this experience with Jesus Christ in the morning that bleeds into every aspect of our lives, and he will speak into our lives in areas where we don't want to hear it. And that's important. He loves us enough to say, I'm going to take issue with something in your life. In fact, do you know what it says in Revelation 3 to the Laodicean church, which is us? It's amazing. We, we, are, we are a church that believes firmly in the character of God, that God is love. And that's what the Bible teaches, plain and simple. I mean, that God is a God of self-sacrificing love, that, that this is the essence and the totality of his character, that everything he does, everything he is, is an outflow of his central self-sacrificing, beneficent character, seeking to bless and uplift his children. And this is who he is at his core. And, you know, sometimes I hear people say things like, yes, God is love, but he is also something else. 
and I say, wait a minute, that something else must be consistent with the love, not in, comp- in competition with it. And so, for example, it says in Revelation 3, it says that he wants to rebuke and chasten his children. Now, at first, I go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready to receive this other face of God where, okay, I like to receive the patience and grace and mercy and love of God. that I need that so much. But then I'm ready to brace myself for him to come in with justice and anger and wrath and rebuke and all of these unloving things. Is that accurate? That's not accurate. It says in Revelation 3, those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. So if we don't look to and look for a God who's going to give us messages in the morning, in our personal time, that hit our areas in our lives that need to be hit. If we're not seeking rebuke and chastening from our loving Father, then we don't have a God of love. Did you catch that? The the, the true character of God includes both aspects of love, both, both expressions of love. The patience and tenderness and forgiveness and what I do with my children because I love them. Rebuke and chasten. That's not any less a loving thing than the softer side and the gracious side. In fact, it's quite gracious for him to rebuke us, isn't it? It's because he loves us. So let's not pit these against each other. Let's not get in a theological corner where, where, we, where we make God's love one thing and then these other things a separate, non-loving thing. No, 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 this is all God's love. And Enoch sought that and experienced that. We're over time, aren't we, right now? We're four minutes over. Hey, how about we talk about Enoch a little bit more tomorrow as well? Because there's more in this book. And Enoch's experience must be ours if we want to be prepared for translation. If we want to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ in our daily experience. Because you know what? You don't gain this maturity of character by by works. There's a statement in Desire of Ages that says that our title to heaven, just as much as our fitness for heaven are both alike found in the righteousness of Christ. So he's wrought out a perfect character in the life he lived on this earth. And he wants to give that to us as a gift, as justification and forgiveness, and as an actual experience of a renewed mind. So we'll talk more about Enoch's experience so we can learn how to live that life of Enoch. Do you know what else we're doing tomorrow? If you have not yet put in your questions on the website, you go to beltoftruthministries.com, go to the contact page. If you have any questions about biblical masculinity, overcoming lust, the brain, all of this stuff we've been talking about, the theology, the Bible, anything. Ask questions, and I'm going to answer questions during tomorrow's session. And you know what else I'm going to do during tomorrow's session? I hope some of you, I haven't even checked my email, I've been so busy yesterday, but I hope some of you have been emailing your victory stories because you may be sitting in here and the guy right next to you is absolutely deep in the struggle of lust addictions and you are on the other side of that fence and you're th- you want to throw him a rope over and say, come on, climb over and we can do this. Give people hope if you've gained victory, okay? Because I'm coming this from the standpoint not of somebody who's you know, got personal testimony and experience on this, not a professional counselor on this. I kind of share the science, the Bible. I'm not, a, I'm not a pornography addiction recovery counselor nor a, porno- a former pornography addict. So the Lord has mercifully spared me from that deep cycle. And so I want those who've been in that depths of the depths of that abyss to speak speak to people anonymously. You can create a fake email, whatever you need to do. I, you know, I, I get so many emails, I won't even know who's who. I'm just going to copy and paste the, the, um, the body of the email, put it in a Word doc- document, abbreviate things. Please try and keep it brief so I can get through them all, and then you can bring hope to those who are struggling today. So let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you've accomplished in your son Jesus Christ the payment for the penalty of our sins on the cross, as well as the uh, bringing about a, a, a perfect character in the human, human mind that Jesus had. And we want to receive that. We want to have this experience of the life of Enoch. And we just pray that you would give us victory over every besetting sin, that we might truly get into your word and make a decision right now to set aside a sacred and sanctified time of each morning, that we would commit to never letting our personal time with you fall by the wayside because we get too busy What a silly, ridiculous thing we have done in being too busy for communion with you, which is our only hope for eternal life and which you deserve because you're such a good God anyway. 
And even if we weren't to gain nothing out of it, we want to praise you and honor you for giving us the grace and salvation that you have given to us at an infinite cost. And I just pray for each soul as we go from here that we would come back on Sabbath as well with one more session to further understand how to walk this walk with Jesus Christ and overcome the lust of the flesh. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This message was recorded at the GYC 2015 conference called Chosen Faithful in Louisville, Kentucky. GYC, a supporting ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, seeks to inspire young people to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, and soul-winning Christians. To download or purchase other resources like this, visit us online at www.gycweb.org.